Well, um, it's Memorial Day weekend. I was never in the military. I always wanted to be in the military. I tried twice to get in the military. I was honest the first time. They rejected me, so I lied the second time. They rejected me again. (laughs) I wanted to be in and serve our country. And uh, I wish I'd have known then what I know now about a whole different army. But I realize that I am in an army. In fact, you can say that I'm in a high-level leadership position in that army. And as that level of leadership, for the last number of what feels like it's been months that I've been uh, challenging the people, the body of Christ, whether watching by way of the internet or coming into this building, I've been challenging and charging people to be obedient to the Lord, to, to, to be obedient to what God has called you to do and, and to live up to what He has wired you to go and do. And so this morning, as I think about military, and I, as, our, as, as our leadership was in the back room praying this morning uh, in, in order in, in, for this service, I, I was reminded of boot camp. And I was reminded that when a, 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 a G, I don't know if they even call them GIs anymore, but when a young man went by bus to wherever, Fort Ord or Fort Lewis or or. or uh, Great Lakes, if you're in the Navy or whatever, wherever they send you for your boot camp. One of the very first things that takes place is, is that GI, that government issue, person, individual, immediately begins to learn how to take orders. How to be obedient. They, they, they show you right off one of the very first things that they do is they, they, they explain to you in, in great detail how unimportant your hairdo is. <laughs> Nobody walks out of that barber shop going, I wish I had that guy's hairdo. Because they all look the same. They've all got the same hairdo. They've all got the same stylish, fashionable, OD green clothes on. They've got the same black boots on. They've got the same headdress on. Everybody looks the same. Why? So they can all be identified as a part of this army or this, this battalion or this, fo- this, this force that God is, is uh, putting together in, in, in the country. And from the moment you go in that place, your, your options are out the door. Your decision making is boiled down to one decision, actually two decisions, yes or no. And if you should happen to unfortunately choose no, you'll wish that you had chewed yes. Am I, am I, I didn't get to go, but I've heard enough stories. I think I'm pretty close. We've sang songs all morning long about the army of God, the little children's version of we, you know, uh, 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 we're in the, the Lord's army and we, we read through scripture about the children of, uh, and the army of God and all that kind of stuff. But today, for some reason in the church, it's all about what I feel like. Well, if I feel like going to church or if it fits into my schedule or if I'm not so busy that, I, that, I, that I've got time to go to church. Listen, I'm pretty glad that God had time to go to the cross for me. Amen. I want to ask you this question this morning. What do you think about when you hear about the word obedience? My children, one of which is here with us this morning. The other one's off somewhere else. I got two boys that are hither and yon. But they learn pretty quick about obedience. Because obedience is important. 
For many of us, it's a, it's the, a realization that we are still under the care and the authority of our parents or even the supervision of a guardian or someone that is in authority over us. But in the world that we live today, our children are being taught to question authority. And that you don't have to do what you're told all the time. Listen, when a teacher told me to shut up and sit down when I was in school, wasn't no options. <laughs> shut up and sit down or pay the consequence. And can I just tell you something? I took a gun to school every day that I had, went to school. I had a gun in my car. You know what? Never shot nobody. Never thought about it. Always had a knife in my pocket. Never one time did I think about shooting anybody, nor did anybody else. Because there we, 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 I grew up in a society and in a culture where respect and authority meant something. Amen. I'm told today that you can go to Walmart and get whatever you want and walk out the door and they won't even mess with you hardly. I tried that. In Drive and Save Market in 1977, my cigarette of choice was Marlboro's. And buddy, I didn't have any money, and so I thought, well, I'll just go steal some. And so I stole a whole carton, stuck him in my coat, walked out the door. Wrong idea. Can I just tell you something? That very, very nice Officer of the law taught me a valuable lesson that day as he slammed my head into the side of the car. Bam! <laughs> Threw me in the back seat, took me to the Roseburg police station, put me in a little room. It really wasn't a jail cell. It was just a little room. Made me give him my dad's phone number at work. Take me to the firing squad. Anything would be better than you calling my dad at work to get his boy from the police. I never stole nothing again. <laughs> no. Because all of a sudden, obedience to the authority and to the laws begin to really mean something to me. You can be your own person these days. You can do your own thing and everybody's okay with it. And if somebody says anything against you, they're narrow-minded, they're bigoted, they're, they're homophobic, they're whatever those big words are, they're old-fashioned, or they're at the very least are politically incorrect. Let me just go on record. I am the poster child for politically incorrect. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to line up with their agenda. I, I'm going to line up with God's agenda. I'm going to speak what God wants me to speak. And, and frankly, if you don't like it, you take it up with God. I want to look at what Scripture says about the subject of obedience. And if you'll turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. And when you get there, stand to your feet. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. First John chapter 2 verse 1 It's clear in the back of the New Testament go to Revelations and hang a left Hang a right yeah hang a right that's right 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now, Father God, I need your help this morning. I need your anointing, God, to share your word the way that I feel like you've given it to me. So, Lord, I pray for your anointing. I pray for every person in the sound of my voice to have your anointing, God, Lord, to receive from you this morning what you would have us to receive. I pray for every person watching by way of the internet, God. I pray for every church in this city, Lord, and in southern Douglas County, God, that your word would go forth today. Lord, that your people and your pastors and your leadership, God, would learn to be obedient to the voice of the Lord and walk in, in your ways, O oh God. And I thank you for it. Now, Lord, I, I pray today, not one person leave the same way that they came in, but be changed and transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, for those that need a touch in their bodies today, God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch them. I pray, God, that you would bring healing where healing needs. I pray, God, you bring peace where peace needs. I pray, God, you bring comfort, Lord, where comfort needs, oh God. And Lord, I just pray that your church would give you glory for all that you're doing right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I, uh, I like to pick the scriptures apart and, 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 and find words that I think are, are important words. And so there's a couple of words that I want to specifically look at today um, in, 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 in verse 1 and in also in verse 2. But the first word is, is advocate, is our advocate. An advocate is, is, uh, is someone that, that speaks on your behalf, amen? John believed that, that born-again Christians are still capable of blowing it sometimes. How many of us would agree with, with that, right? I mean, did Lord help us. And so because we have the, pro, the, the, the potential uh, to blow it and to sin, we're still capable of all kinds of sin, we need an advocate. And so we need to be careful, though, to understand that he isn't saying that, that, that it's going to be uh, a must for us to sin, but rather that he exhorts us through the power of the Holy Spirit not to sin. How many of you blow it? How many of you regret every time you blow it? For those of us that fall into sin, we have to remember that the remedy is to confess the sin and forsake it. And so the assurance of our forgiveness lies in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his heavenly ministry as our advocate. Another word for advocate could be like a lawyer and a, an attorney. And so he's in the very presence of God and, he, and he's speaking on your behalf. How I many of you know that he's better than Perry Mason? Amen. Amen. He better than Matlock. I'm just saying it. And his, his, his payment prog, pro, uh, program's a lot better as well. Amen? <laughs> in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. How I many of you are grateful for that? See, John was no doubt aware that for the Christian who wants to make progress in his spiritual life, nothing is as more demoralizing as sin. And so I, I ask yourself, have you ever asked these kinds of questions? Why did I give in to that temptation again? Anybody with the pastor this morning? Why did I give in to that temptation again? We've all done it. We've all done it. We've all blown it. I knew better. You knew better. How could God forgive me for this? 
See, we have an enemy, and his name is Satan, and he cleverly uses our failures to accuse us. He uses them to fill us with guilt and to cause us to wallow in despair. How many of you know the first song that they did, uh, uh, you know, about pray, I'm going to praise him and all that, you know, that's what we ought to do. We ought to praise the Lord and praise our way out of those situations. We've come to the place where we, 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 we have to come to the place where we rely on the Lord, the righteous one who appears before God as our advocate. And we got we to come to the place where we understand that his forgiveness is for every day. His forgiveness is for when we blow it. We have to come to the place where we realize and rely on Christ, the only righteous one. And he appears before God as our advocate. Hebrews 9 and 24 says, For Christ has not entered the holy places, place, places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us. Jesus Christ is, in fact, our defense attorney. How many of you know when the enemy brings accusation, the Lord looks at the accusation and he says, I don't see it. Amen. They've been washed in the blood. They've been cleansed by the blood. <clears throat> Having paid for all of our sins and purchased our complete forgiveness. How many of you know your forgiveness is complete? <laughs> it's not partial. He's still working on you, but your forgiveness, your redemption, your salvation is complete. Jesus Christ is well able to re represent us before a holy and a righteous God. We do not need to fear judgment. I talked about this a little bit um, on Wednesday night. I talked about, you know, the, the ridiculousness of confronting somebody, as the Scripture calls us, those of us that are godly in Christ Jesus, if you see a brother going sideways, it, it's, our, it's our job it, to go to that person and say, listen, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going this way and you, know, you need to be going this way. And how many of you know most of the time when you're the one going this way, when you're going off course, when you're going astray, and somebody that's on the straight and narrow comes and talks to you about it, all of a sudden, all that's inside of you starts to well up. Who are you to judge me? Ever heard that? You, you have got no right to judge me. I'm, I'm, it's not about judging them. It's about saying, listen, you're, you're, you're getting off course, and I just want to encourage you to stay true to what the Lord has. Well, how about this? I'll just, stay, I'll just stand before God and let God judge me. Can I just tell you, you don't want that? You don't want to stand before God as your judge. You want to stand before him as your redeemer and your savior. Amen? Amen. He, he is for us. He loves us. And because of what the Lord Jesus has done, we're not guilty. Furthermore, we possess the very righteousness of Christ as long as we stay in Christ and walk with Christ. Too many times we think I, once all I got to do is give lip service to Jesus and confess him and I'm set for life. That's not true. You walk away from God and you're walking away from God. He's not walking away from you. The scripture talks too much about being backslidden. Look at the ten virgins. They were all going to the same wedding. Five of them got to go in because they were prepared. The other five were lackadaisical. They weren't ready. They weren't prepared. And they got left out and they beat on the door. But the door had been shut and they did not open the door. We're called to be ready when he comes. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
in him, not just around him, but in him. And so when Christ speaks of, uh, to the Father in our defense, he doesn't falsely claim that they're innocent. The reality is he maintains that we're guilty of sin, but then he points out that he's already paid the penalty. Aren't you glad for that? And so as the people in the Old Testament could approach God when, when, when the blood of the sin offering was sprinkled on the altar, so you and I can have fellowship with God because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. First word we looked at. Obedience. Second word, propitiate, propitiate, that word, propitiation. Is that right? Propitiation. I wish I wouldn't have written it so many times. Propitiation means that Jesus took upon himself the punishment of our sins and satisfied God's righteous judgment against sin. And so, thinking back just for a moment about obedience, in the, New Test- er, in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says this, Then Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. So I want to talk about why Samuel was saying that sacrifice, or rather was Samuel saying, was the sacrifice unimportant? No, it's not unimportant. If it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have sacrificed himself for your sins and mine. But if you jump back a few verses in 1 Samuel 15, back to verse 17, it says this, so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, talking about Saul here, King Saul, he said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head? Were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. And fight against them until they are consumed. Fight against them, listen, until they are consumed. Go back a little bit in that verse. Utterly destroy. Go back a little bit further. The Lord sent him on a mission and said, utterly destroy until they are consumed. Verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And so Saul said to Samuel, he does what most all of us do. He began to make excuses. He began to point the finger in other directions. He began to blame everybody but himself. Saul says to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I did. He said, I, I, I did obey. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I, I've gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and, and, and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Well, did you? Doesn't sound like it. And then an interesting thing takes place. He said, but the people, the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. How many of you know that you can't sacrifice or give as an offering something to the Lord God that should be destroyed? He's not going to accept it. He wants those things offered to him that are pure, that are holy, that are worthy. That's why he ran the money changers out of the temple. Why Jesus run them off? Why? Because they were selling secondhand stuff. They were selling second-rate stuff. 
They were ripping off the people. God's not going to accept your secondhand worship. Saul got himself in a fix. Samuel heard from the Lord that Saul was to be removed as the king because of his disobedience. And if you begin to read carefully the dialogue between Samuel and Saul, it doesn't take very long to see that Saul's trying to lay the blame on the people instead of taking responsibility for the actions of the people. And in verse 9, if you jump back to verse 9, it says, Saul and the people spared Agag. If you jump back, I think it's in verse 7, it says that King Saul spared him. Verse 9, he changes it to Saul and the people. And, that, and they spared Agag and all the best of all the sheep and the cat, cattle and the fatlings and all that was good. It doesn't matter how good it looks. It doesn't matter how good you think it looks. I don't care about any of that. If God says uh, destroy it all, utterly destroy everything, including the king, everybody, every donkey, every cow, every camel, every sheep, the whole kit and caboodle. And he, he failed to do what he was called to do. He says, listen, I, I did what I, we, we killed all that. And, and Samuel says, well, what's that lowing of oxen that I hear? What's that bleeding of the sheep that I hear? What's, what's that? If everything is dead. If everything has been destroyed, how quickly things change. Look again at verses 18 through 21. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed, done away with. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And, and Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission in which he sent me and brought back Agag, king of Al Am Am Amal Amalek. And I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took the plunder. Isn't that amazing? You can sure tell that Saul is kin to Adam. <laughs> Remember what Adam did? Well, it, that woman that you gave me. It wasn't her fault. He should have been the head of that family as God put him. Amen. And that wouldn't have happened. He could have redeemed her, I believe, in that moment. But no, it's that, that woman you gave me. Here we go again. God says to, or Saul says to the man of God, Samuel, it was, it was the people who kept back the best. And after all, it was going to be for a sacrifice to God that we kept it. God does not want stuff that should be utterly destroyed. And we need to learn that God is, in, is not interested in our worthless sacrifice and our excuses. He wants our obedience. You can come with every excuse in the book, but at the end of the day, you, every one of us are going to stand before the Lord and give an, an account to what we did with what God gave us to do. See how quiet it gets. I'm just, remember what I said earlier, my job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. And, and my job is also to, to help you to not fear standing before the Lord because I didn't do what God called me to do. Some of you are teachers. 
Some of you are, 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 are workers out in the field. Some of you are laborers. Some of you are soldiers and generals and sergeants and those kinds of things. But, but where are you? Are you following his orders? Are you taking orders? Are you doing what you're told? Or are you arguing with whoever it is that's your, your, your direct leadership? Are you, are you arguing because the, the stories I've heard, if that's true, you'd be out in the parking lot picking up rocks or peeling 1,700 pounds of potatoes to teach them a lesson. All the stuff that they offered to God was useless, and, and it, especially it was useless as a sacrifice. A sacrifice was a ritualistic trans, tra, transaction between man and God that was a physical demonstration of a relationship that he had between them. But if the person's heart isn't truly repentant, and if, the, if they don't truly love God, then the sacrifice is just some hollow ritual that means nothing. That's why what Jesus did on the cross is so valuable because he gave his whole life. Amen. Right. I remember years ago I used to tell the story of a, of a farmer that was a good farmer. He took good care of his livestock. I mean, he, he got the best hay for them and, 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 you know, he took good care of them. He had nice barns and nice fields and good fences. And the, the barnyard animals got together one day. And they said, we just, we just need to, we just need to show our appreciation for our farmer. And the chicken said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm going to give all these eggs for this big feast that we're going to put on. And, and you pigs, you hogs, you're going to give the bacon and the sausage and the link, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the pig says, now, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It doesn't cost you much to give a few of your eggs, but for me to give ham and bacon, it's going to cost me everything. And I just think this morning that the Lord's looking for a few more hogs and a few less chickens. Is this still working? I think I lost some right there. It's true. Here's the deal. Being religious, going to church, serving on a committee, giving to charity is not enough if we do not act out of our devotion and our obedience to God. For many people, the word obey is in the worst possible sense a four-letter word. It smacks of submission and humility. When we obey, we give up our own agenda. Amen. Four of you. When we obey, we give up our own agenda. And we do the request of another. I, I wish I wouldn't have put request because it's really not a request. He's commanded us. Matthew chapter 28. Mm -hmm. Go ye. The fields are white unto harvest, right? Yep. But the laborers are few. Matthew 28. Go, go and make disciples of all nations. Well, that's talking about you pastors. No, that's talking about you workers. Obedience might not come naturally to the proud people, and it may not be easy. It's not easy for a GI to go to Fort Lewis or Fort Ord or wherever, and, and all of a sudden go from whatever lifestyle that you came from and, and walk into an environment where you have no choices. You have one choice, and that is to be obedient. That is to obey because they know that in an extreme situation under fire, when you're in a foxhole, when you're, when you're in a trench somewhere, and you, you're, you know, there, there, there's no atheist, what I understand, in a foxhole. Amen. 
But when, you're, when you are, be, learn to be obedient, it can save your life. When we learn in the spiritual realm, in the army of God, to be obedient, it will, it will, it will advance and save and help our eternal life. If we're obedient to God, we don't have to worry about our last breath. There are people that don't, that, that death messes them up. Jake Hess used to sing a song, uh, that death ain't no big deal. He, he had tapped into something somewhere along the line that, that he knew that dying's just graduation day. Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die to get there. A lifestyle of complying with God's will is important. Amen. A lifestyle of complying to God's will is very important. Let me close with this, going back to 1 John chapter 2. Kathy, you and John, you might as well come. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So this morning I close with the with with this how are you walking as we walk in the light and see sin as it really is we will hate it and turn from it and if we sin there ought to be something immediate in us that says I need to confess this to God and claim his forgiveness and when we will learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us and we learn to abide in Christ and walk as he walks the life that is real cannot be built on things that are deceptive God's called you to something church and I know that he has because the scripture makes it clear that all have been called but few are chosen what that really means is that there's very few that step up and say use me God however you see fit before we can walk in the light we have to know ourselves we have to accept ourselves and we have to yield ourselves to God I hesitated to even put that line in there because I have a hard time sometimes accepting myself but if God accepts me who am I to not accept me when you walk in the light you live to please only one person and that is God. I've spent my whole life trying to please people. I literally have. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for me to get over that hump that really the only person that I have to please is God. Jesus said, I do always the things that please him. I do always the things that please him. Talking about his father. And church, we ought to walk in ways that please God and please Jesus. And the greatest thing that you and I can do is walk in obedience to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father God, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this weekend that we have set aside to 
honor those that have died protecting the freedoms that we have as a nation under God. But Lord, as we read the news and we see the downturn of the Christianity in our nation, God, I pray for a church that would rise up and be counted that would stand up in obedience to the Lord and do what you have called us to do, to be a light in the darkness, to be a voice to the voiceless, to give love to all that need love. One of the one of the ways that Jesus Christ walked was he walked up what we know as the Via Della Rosa. The Via Della Rosa took him to a place that we call Golgotha, the hill of the skull. And it was on that hill that he offered his life was on that hill where they nailed him to an old rugged cross. It was on that hill where he bled and died for you and for me. And this morning he might be calling you today to make a, a change in the direction of your walk. Because there's two ways you can go. You can go the way of destruction or you can go the way of eternal life. The Bible says that the road to destruction is wide and there are many that find it. But the road that leads to eternal life is narrow. And the scripture says that there are few that find that. Well, I this morning I would like to add to that number. I would like to see a few more begin to walk the narrow way, begin to surrender their life and, and follow Jesus all the way to Calvary. So if you're here today and you find yourself in this service, maybe you've stumbled across us on the internet this morning and, and, and you, you don't know exactly what this all means. Well, what it means is that Jesus said that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. And my job this morning is to make sure that everybody that, 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 that will surrenders their life to Jesus. And so this morning I'm asking you, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to commit my life. I've never accepted Jesus before. But today, I want to commit my life to Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I want to follow him. I want to be obedient. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've never accepted Jesus, but I want to today. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. I want to pray with you. If you'll just slip your hand up, I'll pray with you. Anybody? I just feel like in my spirit that God's working on somebody's heart. <clears throat> Maybe sometime a long time ago. You gave your life to the, to the Lord, but in so many ways it seems like it didn't take, it didn't stick. You found yourself off doing your own thing. Somebody's been praying for you and you're here today or you're watching today because somebody somewhere was praying for you. I'm in this pulpit today because somebody wouldn't quit praying for me. Today, say, Pastor, I recognize and I realize that one time I, I did serve the Lord. I at least gave lip service, but even that has gone. But today I want, I want to make sure that I'm going to make heaven my home. I'm going to, I need to know today, God, will you forgive me? 
would you take me? I want you to know that you've not been too bad, that God can't clean you up in a moment, in an instant. If you'll just slip your hand up and let me pray with you right now, I, I want you to know God will set you free and God will heal you and deliver you. God will write your name in the Lamb's book of life today. Anybody at all, say, Pastor, that's me. I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Anybody at all, Pastor, that's me. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that obedience matters. Lord, I thank you today that even though none of us have been completely obedient, God, your word says that you're patient, you're loving, that you're long-suffering, that God, that you watch over us, you keep working on us. So God, I pray today that you would... uh, God, that you would just be with us. Help us, Lord, to walk with you. Lord, I lift up this prayer request. I pray for a baby right now and a mom that are in critical condition. God, I ask, Lord, as this prayer request has come in over the Internet, I don't know where they're at. I don't know where they're from, and it doesn't matter. They're watching this morning, and, and, and we've prayed, and we believe. And so, God, right now, for this mom and for this baby that are in critical condition, God, I pray that, that you, Lord, that some way, somehow, your Holy Spirit would go and minister healing and health and wholeness, not only to mom and baby, but, God, to the family that's around them right now. God, I speak healing into that situation. I speak healing, Lord. Cousins of the Chambers family. Harley Pendleton. Does anybody know Harley Pendleton? Amen. Do you know do you know anything about this? Okay. Well, God, it doesn't matter you know who they are so Lord we just lift them to you right now and we speak health and wholeness into this family Father and I thank you for it all right now God again I lift Mark and his family to you right now God and ask that you'd bring comfort Lord I know that they are sad that she's no longer with us but God She's in your presence. And I know she lived for you. And I know that one day she knew that she was going to be with you. And today's that day. And God, that's not easy for us that are left here to deal with. But one day, God, and I believe it's sooner than later, we're going to be joining them in your presence. And Father, I thank you for it. Thank you that you've made a way. Now, God, watch over us. Bring us back together tonight. I pray for all the celebrations. I pray for all the the traveling. God, I pray that you'd bring us back. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Lord, bring us back tonight to worship you and to celebrate you tonight. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen and amen. God bless you. God go with you. See you tonight.